welcome to the stage, Dr. Victoria Herman. So two weeks ago on a crisp autumn morning in Washington, D.C., I rose early to travel two hours across the Chesapeake Bay to Maryland's eastern shore. I was traveling to Patriot Point with a colleague, a 290-acre shoreline rambunctiously alive with ducks and deer, fish and crabs. To get to the point from Washington, D.C., you first have to sneak through its suburbs and cross the Bay Bridge, once the longest continuous overwater steel structure in the world. Past the Bay Bridge, you then turn south, driving through endless farmland, dry and rich with 400 years of history. And finally, past the suburbs and the bridge and the farms, you reach the Chesapeake Bay, its waters glistening in the midsummer sun, and a breeze whipping up that brackish smell of salinity into the air. The bay is inspiring, and as I take in the sounds and the smells and the views, my local partner, Steve Beck, interrupts to introduce himself. Steve is the president and CEO of the Military Bowl Foundation, a nonprofit that organizes events and activities for our nation's former and current service members. At Patriot Point, he and property manager Tim have created a retreat for our country's Ill, injured, uh, Ill and injured soldiers. It's a place where they can come to decompress after a deployment, where they can reconnect with family, and where they can heal in nature through hunting, crabbing, yoga, and paddleboarding on the bay. Now, Steve is not my typical local partner, and Patriot Point is unique to most places you'd find me doing climate change research. Usually, I'm up in Alaska, listening to village elders describe how difficult it is to traditionally hunt seal as sea ice melts. Or you'd find me down in Louisiana, learning from tribal leaders how to preserve important plants as sea level rise keep coming into their communities. My partner is in the Arctic and in the Gulf Coast, no climate change better than anyone. They are already using their local and traditional knowledges to adapt to climate impacts on a daily basis. Steve, as we walk through the marshes of Patriot Point, readily admits that he knows very little about climate change. He is unsure what changing weather patterns in the mid-Atlantic mean for the bay, or what global sea level rise measurements mean for his two and a half miles of shoreline. But Steve does know that Patriot Point is eroding at an unprecedented rate. Steve and Tim have watched a single storm erode one, sometimes five feet of land into the bay. They love being able to host hundreds of service members and their families each year at Patriot Point. But they know that soon their historic grounds and 19 errors home are going to be underwater as sea levels rise and more extreme storms roll up the East Coast. That, that fear of loss, and that love of a place that means so much to their community is why I found myself standing with two military bowl vets on a brisk October morning. Steve had emailed me a few weeks ago asking for help. He wanted to understand climate change a bit better and how it would impact Patriot Point. Now, Steve doesn't necessarily have the tools to talk about climate change yet, but he has something far more important to building resilience. He is committed to acting. He had the courage to reach out, cold email me to ask for help, and the compassion, a deep caring for the community he serves to sustain his ability to bring together armed service members at Patriot Point long into the future of this nation. 
Those three things, commitment, compassion, courage, are overflowing in the members of this audience. That's why you're all at Pass Forward, right? You have come here uh, across the state, across the country, some even across an ocean, to gather with thousands of your peers to learn how to better save the places that you love. And I know that's why each of you is a climate change champion, even if you don't know it yet. Your job title might not be adaptation manager or chief resilience officer, but you are already committed to saving places. You had the courage to come here to learn with and from thousands of your peers, and you care compassionately about the people that bring those histories, places, and cultures to life. Climate change is the biggest challenge you and the places you love will face in the 21st century. It will challenge who you are as preservationists, as Americans, and as human beings. Not in some distant future, but here, now, in 2018. Our shared home is changing at an alarming and life-threatening rate. Since the late 19th century, our global average surface temperature has increased about 1.62 degrees Fahrenheit. That warming is a direct cause of our own activities, our reliance on fossil fuels, and our use of oil, coal, and natural gas. Most of that warming has come in the past 25 years, and the five warmest years on global record have all come since 2010. It is near impossible to explain how much one or two degrees of warming can devastate our planet by using scientific charts like this. Often, when I try to use scientific models to explain what climate change means for Americans in 2018, audiences are often interested, but not connected. They hear stories of warming sea and air temperatures and try to recall that image of melting ice or bleached coral. But chances are most people have never traveled to the Arctic or the South Pacific to see that devastation firsthand. That interest, but detachment, follows a national trend. Most Americans today believe in man-made climate change, and a majority believe that it is impacting Americans. But most Americans, when polled, do not believe that climate change will harm them personally. That frame of mind is wrong, and it is dangerous. Both coastal and inland communities across our country are already seeing the impacts of climate change. We began 2018 with a powerful nor'easter that left two million people without power across the Northeast states and ultimately caused $2 billion in damage. In the spring, Colorado and Texas saw a hailstorm with hail the size of golf balls to baseballs, disrupting everyday life and causing irreplaceable damage to historic districts and buildings. Over the summer, the Four Corners region of the Southwest saw extreme drought conditions, doing damage not only to historic buildings, but threatening a way of life passed down from generation to generation in farmers and rancher families. In September, Hurricane Florence's storm surge and extreme rainfalls further inland flooded communities across both Carolinas. And right now, as we speak, communities across California are facing the deadliest wildfires in its history. This is what climate change in America looks like. 
that one or two degree of warming means that we will see more extreme and more frequent nor'easters, hailstorms, droughts, hurricanes, and wildfires. 96% of Americans live in counties that have seen an extreme weather disaster in the past five years alone. No matter what corner of this country you call home, be it the coast, the mountains, the Great Lakes, or the Great Plains, climate change is already causing billions of dollars in damages and irreplaceable cultural loss. I know because I've seen that damage firsthand. In 2016 and 2017, my research partner Eli Keene and I traveled across the United States and U.S. territories on a climate change research and storytelling project called America's Eroding Edges. Our journey took us from Alaska to American Samoa, from Mississippi to Miami, to see, hear, and experience America's climate change story. Funded by National Geographic and partnered with the National Trust for Historic Preservation, we interviewed more than 350 local leaders to identify what climate impacts were affecting their communities today and what was needed at the national level to support their adaptations to those impacts. When I first started America's Eroding Edges, I was like Steve, but with historic preservation. I had no idea what cultural heritage was, and I had never heard of the National Trust. I was a climate change researcher. I worked with scientists and traditional knowledge holders, with activists and policymakers. I had never met a historic preservationist at any climate event, negotiation, or rally. I soon learned, though, that you can't do climate change research without including cultural heritage. And you can't do historic preservation without addressing climate change. My partnership with the Trust was a direct result from what I heard and saw across America. When I asked local leaders what impacts of climate change were affecting them most, they spoke about threats to their cultures, their histories, and their traditions. In Anu'u, American Samoa, Peter Taliva showed how sea level rise and saltwater intrusion were killing taro fields, a culturally critical staple food in both everyday dishes and celebratory celebrations. In Miami, Florida, PhD candidate and community activist Kilan Ashad Bishop explained how threats to Miami's multi-billion dollar waterfront were exacerbating gentrification in the high ground historic community of Little Haiti. And in the native village of Teller, Alaska, Mayor Blanche Obanuk Garney showed how thawing permafrost was disrupting the graves of her family members and all of our community from generations past. From hundreds of interviews across this country, the one takeaway message is this. Climate change is, at its core, a story about losing the places and cultures that make us who we are. America's tangible and intangible cultural heritage assets are in danger. Cultural landscapes, ethnographic resources, historic sites, their buildings, and traditions cannot change as quickly as is required to keep up with the rate of climate change. And climate change is not race, gender, or income neutral. Low-income communities, communities of color, and women are disproportionately affected by climate impacts. 
from centuries of discriminatory social, economic, and environmental policies, these communities have not been able to create the resources they need to prepare for and adapt to climate disasters. When there are resources available, they must go to adapting critical infrastructure like clean water, fuel, and schools, leaving cultural heritage at the bottom of the list. These places, these cultures, these traditions need your commitment, your compassion, and your courage to act ambitiously on climate change. Without the combined expertise and experiences here in this room, thousands of places and cultures across this country will not be able to survive climate impacts. Every single person here has a voice to contribute to America's climate change story. We need historic preservationists to give us examples of the ultimate recycling, reusing historic buildings to save energy, places, and land. We need architects to design flexible structures that will adapt with climate impacts both on the coast and in America's heartland. We need planners to create more equitable climate approaches using all of the diverse knowledges in America's cities. We need developers who are going to implement climate-ready, carbon-neutral designs in American communities. And we need researchers to better understand what our climate impacts are and how they will affect our historic places. No matter who you are, we need you in the climate change movement. We cannot afford climate science from anyone in historic preservation. The cost of an action is too high. Some of you here in this audience have already taken the ambitious step to act on climate in your community, in your historic site, and within your cultures. And that's incredible. But we now need you to reach further. There are thousands of communities across America that need your expertise and experiences to adapt to climate change. That's what brought me to Patriot Point two weeks ago, to connect Steve with a volunteer preservationist and a volunteer scientist to adapt his shoreline to sea level rise and more extreme storms. Back in 2016, when I asked community leaders what they needed most to adapt to climate change, they shared a common need for expertise, resources, and guidance beyond what their smaller communities could offer. Today, I'm helping to bring those expertise and resources directly to at-risk communities. With support from the J.N. Kaplan's Innovation Prize and a continued partnership with the National Trust, we are building the first ever skills-based volunteering platform for cultural heritage climate change adaptation. The platform called Rise Up to Rising Tides is a new matchmaking tool to connect at-risk communities and organizations directly with pro bono assistance from the historic preservation and science communities. We are already connecting dozens of community organizations like Patriot Point with volunteers to help them adapt from one hour phone calls to talk through a preservation question to fully fledged multi-month projects to develop a cultural resource adaptation plan. But here's the thing, rising tides is powered by people. It only is revolutionary if preservation professionals like you step up and be the game changers we need to tackle climate change head on. It is amazing that you are all here in San Francisco listening and learning to new knowledge about resilience, but listening is not enough. In order to be part of the climate change solution, 
in order for your histories, your cultures, your traditions to be part of the climate change solution, you need to act. And so I have a bit of pass forward homework for all of you. Once you're wrapping up in San Francisco and you're heading home, I need each of you to do five things to directly address climate change. One, identify how climate change intersects with the work that you are already doing and better understand what climate impacts are threatening your historic sites, your cultural heritage, and your traditions. Two, make a commitment to use the tools that you learn here in San Francisco to act on climate back at home. Use this keynote, our panel discussion, and the learning labs to understand how you can adapt your historic places and how you can mitigate your greenhouse gas emissions. Three, if you don't have the resources or expertise that you need to do that, be courageous and ask for help. Register with Rising Tides and create your own volunteer project so that you can get the expertise from other historic preservationists or climate scientists to help you act. Four, if you are already working on climate change, be compassionate, reach out and help others. Register as a volunteer so you can give back and build our national resilience. And five, when you go home, bring the message of climate action back to five of your colleagues. We cannot afford to act alone. The recent hurricanes and wildfires have put the urgency of adapting our communities and our cultural heritage front and center. But that is only the tip of the iceberg. Last month, in a UN special report, scientists from around the world concluded that we have just 12 years to contain a climate change catastrophe. That means that we both need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to the impacts of climate change we can no longer avoid. I'll admit, when thousands of global scientists get together and tell you that you have just 12 years to avert mass extinctions and the current administration of your country does not believe in man-made climate change, it's easy to feel hopeless and helpless. But then I think of where I was when I was just starting out on the America Eroding Edges project. I didn't know a single historic preservationist working on climate change. Three years later, I now have dozens of colleagues and friends that have dedicated their lives to saving places, histories, and culture from climate impacts and making those histories, cultures, and traditions part of our climate solution. And now, as I'm looking out at the hundreds of you, I see hundreds more climate champions that are going to do everything they can to save the places that matter most to you, that will make your cultures and your traditions part of the climate change solution. And when you look at it that way, climate change in America seems pretty hopeful. So I'll see all of you at our next climate change event, our climate change negotiations, and our next climate change rally. Thank you. All right. Please welcome to the stage our Trust Live responders, Karen Jan, Heather Hodges, Elaine Forbes, and our moderator, Andrew Potts.
So, wow. Thank you, Victoria. That was brilliant. Mm -hmm. And good morning. My name is Andrew Potts, and I have the pleasure of moderating the final segment of this Resilience Trust Live. Also, I want to give a special welcome to those folks around the world who are watching us via live streaming. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on what part of the world you're in. So uh, the way the next half an hour or so will work is the Trust has assembled this amazing group of thought leaders, and we're going to try to pick up where Victoria left off and riff on that and take the conversation in a couple different directions. Um, but just to say again, Victoria, I thought that was fantastic. I was really struck by how you drove home the urgency of the climate change situation. I, I was really touched by the point you made that, yes, historic preservation is at risk to climate change, but historic preservation cultural resources are also an asset to communities trying to grapple with climate change. And also, I note the point you made about how we need to not only have climate change conversations at heritage meetings, but we need to provoke heritage conversations at climate change meetings. And that's why I'm particularly impressed by the group of thought leaders the Trust has assembled, because, well, we do have some heritage ringers up here. We also have folks who wear a variety of other hats. So I think we're really going to be able to have that kind of transversal, cross-cutting conversation here this morning. So this segment is meant to be sort of a free-ranging, uh, roundtable kind of conversation. I'm going to soft launch that by giving a question directly to each of the panelists, and then after that, we'll move to um, the roundtable format. And so, Elaine, if it's okay if I start with you. Uh, I think I can speak for everyone in the room when I say how much we are in love with the historic urban landscape that we are currently surrounded by. Um, it's fantastic, the Embarcadero, the ferry building, uh, the finger piers. Yes, a round of applause for <laughs> the space. What folks may not know is that the agency you had, the Port of San Francisco, is responsible for the management a lot of a lot of this terrain. Um, what folks may or may not also know is that much of this terrain is threatened by sea level rise. And so I want to go directly to that topic. I think a, a way that your work connects with, a lot of, with the work of a lot of folks in this room is that you're managing real estate. So we have a lot of folks in the room who manage real estate, site managers, uh, portfolio managers. And all of you have a host of everyday challenges, of today challenges that demand your attention. And then we have this idea of sea level rise, sometimes called a slow onset problem. Yes, we see some effects today, but more of the effects may be farther in the future. And so, Elaine, I'm curious, given all the responsibilities and all the today demands you have, how is the port able to make the commitment you've made to addressing a slow onset problem like sea level rise? Thank you so much for the question. I, I do manage an amazing portfolio <laughs> on behalf of all of you. Uh, so it's publicly owned land, and that's a very important piece of, of our mission. And the finger piers are part of a uh, national register of historic places, really one of a kind, 100-year-old finger piers that were the formation of the city uh, with brake bulk cargo, helped our city grow, and really defines the water's edge. And I think Victoria made a good point. It feels like sea level rise is a patient problem, but it's not so patient. You know, in my portfolio, uh, we have to get under our piers and repair them. I have pile drivers, I have plumbers, and the time that we can get under the piers is shortening every single year. And so we're realizing we need to immediately move our plumbing above deck because we won't be able to repair it per the tide. Um, we see... Um, a desire and a need to find San Francisco's edge and to, I guess I would call it, aggressive adaptation or aggressive incrementalism where I know that nobody, nobody would want me to build a six-foot wall today along the Embarcadero and turn away and say, okay, we've adapted to climate change. That's clearly not the right approach. Uh, so we need to look at what we have, how to preserve what we have, and how to buy runway with what we have before we have to make major urban scale changes. Uh, so one of the things we're doing is improving the soils underneath that Embarcadero. Very, very susceptible to earthquake and often on the shoreline there's multiple hazards. It's not just the, the sea level rise impact from climate change, but it's other fundamentals. Uh, so we're working to repair our seawall, 
strengthen it so we have a stable foundation on which to adapt over time. And I'll tell you honestly, I do not have a plan for the finger piers out 2100 and beyond. I don't know how to save them at this point. Uh, but we will continue to work together and see what we can save and how we can save it through community dialogue. Great, thank you, Elaine. Karen, uh, if I could call on you next. So you had an organization called Neighborly, and as I understand the mission of Neighborly, it's to democratize public finance. So you're using uh, digital networks to empower more people to contribute capital to community-based infrastructure projects in general, and in particular, climate change mitigation projects like renewable energy, climate change adaptation, resilience projects. So when I hear that mission statement, I think of municipal bonds, mm -hmm. I think of high tech, I think of climate finance. So what is a nice municipal bond person like you doing at a historic preservation conference? <laughs> and, and how do you connect climate finance to things that will perhaps be more familiar to the folks in the room like cultural identity, community, uh, cultural capital, cultural heritage? Absolutely. Well, thank you all for inviting me to be part of this esteemed panel. Um, it's been a, a, great, uh, a great morning so far. So at Neighborly, we are a uh, public finance technology platform that connects communities to capital. You mentioned municipal finance. It is a $3.8 trillion marketplace here in the United States that finances some of our most um, amazing public goods. We're talking about bridges, parks, schools. Um, the iconic Golden Gate Bridge that I think was up earlier is a result of municipal finance. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, I, I bring that up because it's such a symbol of um, our iconic landscape here in the Bay Area. And it was really driven um, by community input. Um, so back in the day when um, folks literally got to vote themselves a job by, um, you know, uh, bonding for this bridge, there was, you know, many different public agencies involved, including the U.S. military, that wanted the bridge to be brave or black and white. Um, and there was an artist in Berkeley who was watching this beautiful bridge grow up in the bay and said, no. It needs to stay the color that it is. And it was painted that orange color to protect it from rusting. Um, and the community actually started writing into their government officials saying, do not paint this bridge. It must remain the color that it is. And I tell that story because I think at Neighborly, we want to bring back the community voice yeah. to our public infrastructure project. Mm -hmm. Because who knows better what um, we need as a community than the people who are living there. Mm -hmm. um, prior to Neighborly, I was uh, the chief resilience officer in Oakland. Um, and I completely agree with your comments that, you know, we can look at our liquefaction maps our um, sea level rise maps with our um, most disadvantaged communities, um, and they overlay. And so when I think about culture and communities, I think about the displacement question a lot and how what we are doing to our environment today is breaking the binds that tie us. So when we talk about culture, it really is a story about people and communities. Um, and it's not just preserving the, the places we love, but the people we love as well. And so I think through, you know, we are taking the, the role of what, um, what can infrastructure finance do to become more resilient, thinking about multi-use um, infrastructure that can adapt to a changing climate. So it's not just about a road that you drive a car down. It can be, you know, something that you lay fiber down to build broadband um, infrastructure or to have semi-permeable uh, pavement um, when those king tides come in. So how can we be more flexible with our design of our communities? And then how do we finance those resilient projects? Mm -hmm. So we see how the threat of climate change really puts a premium on putting people in preservation. Absolutely. Thank you. Heather. Yes. You have, must have one of the best jobs in I, the world. I do. <laughs> I do. I love it. Running the Gullah, Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. Mm -hmm. So I know a little bit about the Gullah Geechee. I'd like to know more. But when I think of the Gullah Geechee, I think of a people whose history and whose heritage is tied to some specific territories mm -hmm. and mostly to coastal areas and sea islands. And we know some of those territories are facing change, mm -hmm. climate-induced change. And so I'm curious, uh, from the perspective of a person who heads an organization whose mandate is to celebrate that culture, 
what does the prospect or maybe the reality of changes to that territory mean for your mission? Sure. First, I'd like to say thank you to the National Trust for inviting us to be part of this conversation. I'm always happy to come out and talk about the Gullah Geechee heritage that is in harm's way. And when I say in harm's way, referring to the fact that the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is a 400-mile stretch of the Atlantic coastline from Pender County, North Carolina, near where Wilmington is, down to St. Augustine, Florida, and St. John's County. So we are in directly in harm's way, and we actually showed up on Victoria's map because Hurricane Florence hit at the heart of the, of the corridor. So while many people are familiar, or are familiar with the corridor and understand that it's a national heritage area and it received that designation in part in, able to, in order to, for us to tell the story of the significant cultural and historical contributions of the Gullah Geechee people, a lot of people don't know that there's also a federal commission in place to oversee the administration of the corridor. And one of the very specific things we're charged with doing at the commission is identifying and preserving historic sites of interest to our historic sites for the Gullah Geechee people. Uh, and what climate change has done is it's accelerated and greatly complicated that process. I'll give you a real specific example. In August of this year, I held a series of commission meetings in a fishing community called Southport, North Carolina. One day of meetings was held at the historic Mount Carmel AME Church. After the meetings concluded, which is Freedman's Church in Southport, after the meetings concluded, the community members probably took us over to a Freedman's Cemetery that they had spent a great deal of time restoring. This was in August, less than a month later after Hurricane Florence hit, I was back. The steeple was gone from the church. Mm. Trees had fallen in the cemetery and we had graves that were exposed and open. So these were two successful preservation projects that we're having to start over with. Um, and so that is the impact of the increase in the number of extreme weather events and the increase in the number of inundation events on our work because we are in harm's way and the frequency with, what the, with which these events are hitting in the corridor is greatly complicating our preservation efforts. Thank you, Heather. So I promised you we would have a diverse group of perspectives and I think we've delivered on that. Well, one thing that does unite all the panelists though is they work for organizations, they have professional careers where they have chosen to prioritize climate action, where they have made a choice personally for their career, for their organization, to make climate action an element of their work. And so I'm curious just to pick up on that and ask you, how did that happen? How did your organization come to the decision, or how did you personally come to the decision to incorporate climate action? And how did you pick the pieces of it, the priorities that you have? Obviously, no one organization can fix climate change. No country can fix climate change. So how did you pick the aspects of the issue that you wanted to work on. Hmm. And I'll, we're just now gonna do it round table style. Okay, I can start. I had no choice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because the water's edge is subjected and inundated with the impacts of climate change. So I think for, you know, it's so bizarre that this is a political conversation because for the people who, whose assets are getting wet and the sea is, the bay rise is changing, you have no choice but to respond. Um, so I'm one of the no choice folks. And I, you know, when I became the port director, I had no idea that, you know, 80% of my time would be on sea rise, earthquake, climate change, and hazards. Um, but that's absolutely what it's about because I need to prepare the waterfront for the next generation. And if I'm not thinking about it now, we're not going to get it done uh, because these public projects they have very long twitches. You have to find the money. You have to find public consensus. You have to plan it right. You have to get it perfectly environmentally correct. You need to preserve your assets to the point possible, to the, the maximum extent possible. And crafting a response is a very long twitch effort. And if we weren't on it now, I can guarantee you we would not be delivering for the future generations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Feel free to break into applause at any time. 
So I'm definitely in the no choice category <laughs> as well. Um, you know, we are living in a rapidly changing economy environment. Um, it's not lost upon us at Neighborly that, you know, we're a technology company looking into the future. And the future looks very different than the way we are living today. Um, I think there's a lot of conversations around quality of life. What does that mean? How do we want to live? Mm -hmm. um, and that all ties back into this conversation around resilient infrastructure and communities. So, you know, we're kind of playing a little bit of the long game, even though the long game now is only 12 years <laughs> or less. Um, but thinking about what, what changes do we need to make um, to be able to accelerate the development of these um, infrastructure improvements. So actually tomorrow we're gonna be announcing the winners um, of an, a broadband accelerator challenge that we did. We felt like digital infrastructure was like the most basic form of um, infrastructure improvement we need to do to think about, you know, community solar microgrids, how to maybe even live off mm -hmm. the grid, mm -hmm. um, how can we monitor loads and pricing in real time, and all of those things, you know, thinking about autonomous vehicles, and will that actually lead to a decrease in carbon emissions if we're talking about electric cars and, and maybe, you know, not having um, folks drive around the city so much as we know that that's a huge contributor to carbon emissions. Um, so there's just a whole rethinking right now um, um, that we are a part of. And I think that for us, climate is just the perfect kind of um, driver of these conversations and making sure we act on them. We are in the same position. Uh, so the corridor has a, what we call a management plan, which is a strategic plan uh, for the commission to follow in terms of administering various aspects of the corridor. It is a couple hundred of pages long Ladies and gentlemen, it has exactly two paragraphs on climate change. It was adopted in 2013. Two paragraphs out of several hundred pages. Um, so it's more of a statement of concern, actually. It acknowledges that climate change and sea rise and an increase in extreme weather events is going to have a significant impact on cultural resources in the corridor, and that's it. And that's what I inherited as executive director of the, of the commission. Um, and it has come to us. I mean, very literally, when you talk about Hurricane Florence, our offices are on Johns Island, South Carolina. We had to evacuate with, with everyone else and still try and triage all of the situations that were happening across the corridor. Corridor reporters were calling us, asking us for, for help to try and cover the story. They were asking us to stake out positions, and none of this work has been done yet. So we are in the process of trying to play catch up. Mm -hmm. um, as these events increase, um, as we start to see the magnitude of what the problems are going to be. In the wake of Florence, we talked about Hurricane Florence. We didn't talk as much about the subsequent upland flooding of what we call the Rice Rivers, which held some communities hostage for weeks as we waited for these rivers to crest. And they crested at historic levels. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, again, we've been talking about, you know, climate change with respect to its impact on the coast. We also have communities in harm's way that lay along these rivers, the Cape Fear River, which flooded at historic levels, the Waccamaw River, which flooded at historic levels. And so we are, we are definitely playing catch up and trying to figure out what our positions are going to be. And keep in mind, this is complicated by the fact that the corridor covers almost 30 counties. It straddles four states and hundreds of thousands of people. Um, so just the range of issues that we're being asked to address, the number of stakeholders that have to be consulted, um, the myriad advocacy groups that are on the ground in these different communities, it's been a challenge for us to try and figure out how we move forward, but it, it's become a priority, uh, and we're going to have to figure out how to, how to address it because it's, its impact is clear, and it's, it's already starting to... To hit home for us. And so I'm, uh, I'm guessing at this point the port has fairly voluminous planning, strategic planning for climate change impacts for sea level rise. And Heather, your point is that you, your management plan right now is two paragraphs. And so maybe if, if you could just talk to each other a little bit about the role that, that planning, <laughs> that, 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 man, that is, the, the planning process and how um, ma property management planning, strategic planning figures into how you can move forward on climate action. Okay, I don't want to oversell what we have. <laughs> okay, fair um, enough. So I think that, yes, we do have strategic planning and we've been doing community engagement. I think we have the benefit that 
you may or may not have, of having a waterfront land use plan for the Port of San Francisco, um, which was a huge community process. We just updated it this last year to add a whole section on resiliency and climate change. And so that ongoing dialogue with the community has been very good in updating our planning documents. But honestly, what we're going to do on the ground from a capital perspective is still absolutely to be determined. Mm -hmm. So we're in the phase of hazard risk assessment, uh, looking at what's beneath the Embarcadero, the seawall, that we have a three mile stretch that provides flood protection to 500 acres of the downtown, including Muni and BART and utilities and outfalls and emergency response facilities. So we're looking at where we need to shore up and how to do an adaptation plan. But I can't paint a picture for you today, so I don't want to oversell where we are. Mm -hmm. um, but we are very aggressively working through, um, I think it will be a 20-year plan of improvements that we'll need to put on the ground. Is this inspiring you or daunting? It, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, it, and it, it's, it, yes, it is inspiring. And it's, it's also, uh, it's, I'm grateful that the National Trust um, has taken up this challenge as well of, of trying to figure out how they collaborate and partner with us that are at the grassroots level in the community and trying to think through think through these issues, but I, so I think it's going to require a lot of different talents that are going to have to be brought to, brought to bear, and we welcome the collaboration. We welcome the pro bono <laughs> assistance mm -hmm. greatly, uh, because there are, a lot of, there are a lot of challenges there that we need to, to work through very quickly. I, like, I tell people all the time, hurricane season is going to come again, and we know when it's going to come again. It's going to come next year. Um, and we had talked about Florence, we didn't talk about Michael, which came across part of the corridor also. So we actually got hit twice mm -hmm. this year. Um, and so we know we need to move quickly to try and figure out what strategies we need to, to put in place. And if I can say, it takes a great deal of funding. So mm. I think that that's a, a, a benefit that I have in San Francisco, that I got an $8 million budget for planning the city just approved a $425 million bond at 82% for implementation of phase one. So I have plenty of funding, but without funding, it's almost impossible to do this work because I need so many consultants on the ground helping me understand the problem to discuss it with the community. It's complex. It's very complex. And maybe where that's where climate finance comes in. Sure. And just to add to that, I think the legislation, you know, that you're you mentioned really helps drive the conversation around climate finance and what does the community want to see in these projects. Um, in Oakland, we had passed something called Measure KK, where we actually built resiliency and an equity lens into our um, uh, bonding authorization. And it's struck a conversation with, well, what does that mean? You know, how do we measure resiliency? How are we going to uh, measure the equitable impacts? And I think, you know, being creative, thinking of these different data points, um, I know at Neighborly, you know, we have an impact analytics framework that we've designed to try to get to the bottom of this, because we can talk about it in very abstract terms, but we all know that even public agencies, especially the port, has, you know, very um, rich uh, sources of information and data That's that right. would really benefit the community from understanding the scope of the problem, mm -hmm. but also how they can play a role in helping to, to solve it. Um, and I just want to give a quick plug because San Francisco was so instrumental in um, our, um, uh, I guess, education around how to think about mitigation and adaptation and um, your uh, capital improvement planning process. I think everybody should check out because it is really, I think, on the cutting edge of thinking about resiliency and how to incorporate it in to your planning process. Thank you for that. And Victoria, this term equity has come up a couple of times. We're in our last uh, minute of it, but I wonder if you could just uh, underscore that point that you made in your earlier presentation. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think for me, equity is the foundation upon which all climate change decisions are made. Um, I started my climate work in the Arctic, and that is really the nexus points of equity and climate change. The communities that are most impacted by climate change across the circumpolar north 
are some of the most geographically remote. Um, they are almost all native communities and they have been disproportionately affected by discriminatory government policies um, over the course of several centuries in some countries. And any decision that is made about climate change adaptation or mitigation has to be rooted in equity or else you are going to exacerbate injustices that already exist um, climate change can be an avenue to provide healing for some of those injustices and to reinstate agency that's been taken away from communities, but only if you have that lens in mind. That doesn't come naturally. That needs to be an active choice, um, not just in the Arctic, but anywhere that you're working on climate change and historic preservation. So I, I so wish this conversation could continue, but we're out of time. The good news, though, is that the conversation will continue. And if we could put up on the screen the, um, the set of sessions that will round out the resiliency track here at Pass Forward, um, you'll see today, tomorrow, and Friday, we will continue the conversation. I hope you will attend these sessions. Um, if you're on social media, feel free to add to the Pass Forward 18 hashtag, also hashtag climate heritage. Join the conversation pick up the gauntlet that Victoria has laid down for us. And thank you for joining us at this Trust Live session.